That's fine. OK. Um, today, I just wanted to be talking about, in continuation, basically, to what my brother Ravi has been talking about, talking about the main event, what Jesus did for us, who Jesus is and what he did for us. So that's what I'll be talking about today. And I'll start off by mentioning that when Jesus was here on earth, he was revealing the kingdom. That's what he always preached wherever he was. So that's why when he was alone with his disciples, he would be telling them the secrets of the kingdom. And he would tell them statements like, to you the secrets of the given, the secrets of the kingdom of God are given, but to them that are outside, it just comes as parables. That's why the disciples could get to hear choice words. But when Jesus tried to say those same choice words to the people outside, they almost stoned him. You have several occasions in the book of John where the moment he mentions that he is I am, they try and stone him. The moment he tells them that he was there before Abraham, they try and stone him. The moment he tells them that the Father is in him, they try and stone him. The moment he says that he is the Messiah to the guys in Nazareth, they immediately pick him up and try and throw him over the cliff and he has to miraculously escape from them. They could not keep the secrets of the kingdom. But then the secret to how Jesus operated on this earth is what we're going to be talking about. Because he says, the words that I speak, that's in John chapter 5, the words that I speak are not mine, but from the Father. The words that I speak are life in their spirit. That was the secret of how he operated. He did not just speak anything that came into his mind. He spoke what the Father told him to speak. And that's the secret to operating as Jesus did. The words that I speak are not mine, but they are from the Father. The words that I speak are life in their spirit. That's how he operated on this earth. So um, the first scripture is uh, 1 Peter 2.24. And the New King James Version, if it's possible to have it up there, that would be good. And whilst he's putting that scripture up there, like I said, understanding that secret of the words of the Father is even portrayed in Psalm 91. If you have studied Psalm 91, you realize the first two verses simply say, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I shall say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in Him I shall trust. First two verses, that's it. That's your responsibility. The rest of Psalm 91 happens automatically if you've aligned yourself with what God has spoken. That's the secret to Psalm 91. Those first two verses is your part. Even at the end of the psalm, it says, because he has put his love upon me, I will place him up on high and I will hear him when he cries to me. That's in Psalm 91. Right, is the verse up? Oh, sorry, if you can. Uh, sorry, First Peter 2.24. 1 Peter 2.24. I'll put this aside. Yep. Right. Okay. No, that's all right then. We'll do it that way. So, um, as my brother Ravi had already started, I think he was being led, because <laughs> that's what I'm preaching about. So, what Jesus Christ did at the cross, that's the good news for us. Some people call it the nearly too good to be true news, because what Jesus Christ did, none of us deserved it, but he still decided to go ahead and do it. So, this verse describes that main event. Jesus Christ himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Who does that? Who does that? He himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. He took all your sins. You didn't even have to ask him. You didn't ask him to do it. He took all your sins and placed them on his body on the tree such that you would be separated from sins forever. You died to sins. That's how he set it up. So that the separation between you and your sins is a death separation. There is no way you'd be able to go back to it. And it is to your advantage such that you might live for righteousness. Righteousness means you now live in God's presence forever. Once you believe in Jesus Christ. Who does that? <laughs> Only Jesus can do that. And guess what? He says by 
your stri- by his stripes you were healed. Jesus Christ not only takes care of all your sins, he takes care of everything that resulted because of sin. He removes our sicknesses. By his stripes we were healed. Simply by what he did at the cross. He decided to do it because he is love. That's the main event which changes everything. So there's If you place yourself in Christ by believing in Jesus, he separates you from sins. He separates you from sickness. Because in the garden, with the first Adam, there was no sin. There was no sickness. There was no poverty. And there was no pain. That's the original first Adam. The second Adam came to restore exactly that. And that is the position which God has given you. That's why when the second Adam came, when Jesus was here, there was no day when he was sick. Was there ever an occasion when people came to hear Jesus and the disciples tell him, no, today he's got a day off, he's got a headache. He's not feeling well. No such occasions. He walked in the fullness of the kingdom to show us what we should be walking in. That's what he provided at the cross. As you believe in Jesus, as you trust in him, you connect. Basically, you become one with him and he restores everything which Adam lost. In the Ephesians chapter 6, I'll let um, him put it on the screen as well. Ephesians chapter 6, let me give you the exact verse. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 14. These are part of the secrets of the kingdom. Uh, Paul is writing to the church in Ephesians and he says, Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness... Next one, keep going. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and having taking, having above all taking the shield of faith, which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. What Paul is showing them is you have to be established in truth, in righteousness, in peace, in faith, established in your salvation, and established in the word of God, and continually be praying, being led by the Spirit. That's how you stand against all the deceptions of the devil. All the deceptions of the devil come to try and displace you from your position which Christ has already given you. And once you believe those lies, those lies take place in your life. That's why Christians will continually always spend most of their prayer time just confessing sin, confessing sin, confessing sin, yet Jesus Christ took care of it at the cross. So to them, prayer is not exciting because they are, they've been taught a prayer life whereby they go and dig up anything bad in their past, then they bring it to God. And they're informing God as if he doesn't know. <laughs> so prayer becomes about you telling God, you see, who is the ignorant one here? It's not God, it's you. God is the all-knowing God. He is the one who supplied the answer to your sins before you were even born anyway. So Paul is saying, if you establish yourself in truth, in righteousness, in peace, in faith, in salvation, in the word of God, and you're praying in the spirit, you'll be able to stand, stand in the evil day. Even whatever the devil throws at you, you'll be able to stand. He's not talking about fighting the devil. He's talking about just standing because Jesus did the fighting and won already. It gives you a different mindset. Your mission is not to fight the devil. That was never in the message of the kingdom, to fight the devil. Jesus Christ did that and he won the victory at the cross. And the devil keeps coming to lie to us, to to pretend like what Jesus Christ did at the cross was not enough. It's just like in Acts chapter 4 when the disciples were preaching they get arrested for preaching in the temple by the priest and his soldiers. And then after they are arrested, they get flogged and they are told, fine, you can preach, fine, you can speak to people, fine, you can have meetings in the temple. Just one condition, don't preach in the name of Jesus. That's the condition they were given. And that's exactly the same deception of the enemy. You can do anything you want in church, you can do anything religious you want, but just make sure these people don't do it in the name of Jesus. Don't do it in the authority of Jesus. It's like that scenario of you, you're trying to watch an important program on the TV. Imagine that. 
you're seated watching a programming program on your TV, and your two, two year old keeps grabbing the remote and pressing it, changing the volume, changing the channel, and you have to grab it back and correct everything. But then the two year old keeps pressing buttons which you don't know how to fix now, and you have to switch off at the mains and start again. So the trick is simple when the two year old is not watching, let's remove the batteries. Then when the two year old cries, here's the remote. <laughs> Now you can press this, you can press that, you can press three buttons at the same time. No problem, I'll watch my program. That's the exact same thing. So the devil says you can do whatever you like. You can fill you know, your church pews, you can do religious activities as long as you don't know your position in Christ. All of it is powerless. The main event happened when Christ united himself with you. And he went to the cross, and as he died on the cross, you were crucified with him. You died with him, and you were buried with him as he was buried. And you resurrected with him when he was resurrected. And he went, he was, as you, after resurrection, he went to sit in the heavens at the right hand of God. And you were raised up with him at the same time to be seated in the heavens. Once you understand that position, it changes everything. If you don't understand that position, you can keep pressing the remote as many times. You can try this trick, try this verse, try this combination of buttons, no power, no results. The remote will not work as long as the power has been pulled out. That's what religion is all about. You'll get busy, you'll get tired, you'll get stressed, frustrated because the remote has no power. You'll try this formula. Let's try this trick. I saw this on another preacher. I saw this on another church on the internet. But the only way for all this to have power is if you are doing it from a position of being seated in Christ in the heavens. If that's what you have studied and fully believe that you are seated in the heavens with Christ, everything else now has power. Every verse starts having power. You fully understand that Jesus took care of everything at the cross. So, like I said, as Jesus Christ came, he restored what the first Adam had lost. And the important thing is, as you are seated in the heavens, view everything from that perspective. The mountaintop view is so different from the view when you are in the middle of the traffic and in the congestion. It's a different view. If you are seated, if you see yourself seated in the heavens and being led by the Spirit of God, it's easy to see the end from the beginning and you don't worry about the petty little things that are happening in between. The temporary events that are around you, ignore them. See the end, what God has said. If you are being Spirit-led, Yes, I could tell that you're being spirit-led. Is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faith, and self-control. What you're experiencing. Because that's what Paul describes in Galatians chapter 5 as the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faith, and self-control. That's what comes out when you're being spirit-led. If you are experiencing frustration, then cross-check, am I being spirit-led? Are you frustrated in your giving? Am I being spirit-led as was taught? <laughs> is it spirit-led giving or it's formula-based effort <laughs> type of giving? <laughs> if you're spirit-led, then God knows what, how you should do it and he'll tell you. If you are led by the Spirit and you view life from being seated in Christ Jesus, one, you are secure. Nothing moves you. You don't depend on what the world says or what's happening around in the world. You are secure. You are not moved by the events that are happening day to day. If you are seated in the heavens, you can hear God easily and you can recognize when God is speaking to you. If you are seated in the heavens and being led by the Spirit, you have an earnest expectation filled with joy about your future. How many of you are joyful about your future? Ask yourself that. <laughs> Do you have an earnest expectation with joy of tomorrow? Just decide to be seated with Christ Jesus in the heavens. 
and all the anxiety will evaporate. All the anxiety. Because when you sit down, you'll begin to realize that all your cares just need to be cast on Jesus. And you choose not to worry about anything. And it all goes back, like I said, to what Jesus Christ did at the cross. If we know and understand what Jesus Christ did for us, and we see ourselves seated with him, and we do everything from that position, even at work, are you frustrated about something at work? Are you being spirit-led? And do you view it from the position of being seated with Jesus Christ? If you see yourself as somebody seated in the heavens with Christ, then the petty little things at work will not move you. Even if you've got a boss who's not kind, it won't move you at all because you are higher than him. The only reason you are frustrated is because the lie of the devil is affecting you making you see him higher than you. So every little move he does irritates you. (laughs) But if we change it, I'm here in the heavens and he is on earth. Any tiny move he does doesn't change me at all. Any frustrations in your marriage, be spirit-led. Any frustrations in your finances, be spirit-led. See yourself as being seated in the heavens. It will change everything, like I said. But another thing is that when it comes to being spirit-led, I know as a young believer, it was something which was fearful for me. And I know there may be some who find it a fearful thing to actually be (laughs) spirit-led. Simple reason is that you have to first of all fully believe that God is good and is good all the time. If you fully believe that and you're fully persuaded that God is good all the time, then you won't be afraid to be spirit-led and to be led by God. If you have reservations about God's goodness, then that introduces a fear about God leading you. Be fully persuaded that God is good all the time and he does not change. No matter what circumstances say, God does not change. No matter what other people have said, even Christians, God does not change. He is good and is always good. Every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. And another reason is that some people fear being spirit-led or fear receiving spiritual words because the enemy has lied and deceived people to make us believe that their principalities and their powers and their rulers of darkness above you. And that fear is what will connect you to the enemy. The fear of believing in the power of the devil, basically. Because once you believe there are principalities and powers and rulers of darkness above you, then you are scared of hearing anything from the heavens. And because of that fear, the devil always thrives on that fear. So if you are, fe- if you are fearful of hearing from God, you will inwardly fear certain scripture or certain verses in the Bible. Ask yourself now, are there any verses in the Bible which you are afraid of? This only happens because the devil has managed to introduce deception. Yet the word of God is all good news if you know and understand it. So how do we get rid of the fear then? The Bible says perfect love is what casts out fear. God himself is perfect love. You have to understand that God is good all the time and he is perfect love. He is love always. His attitude towards you is always an attitude of loving. No one has ever gone to the cross and died for you. Even if you ask them to. (laughs) You You have to understand that God loved you so much. He took care of everything before you were even born. Which means the solution to every problem you're going to face, God saw it in advance. Because he's not limited by time. And he provided solutions for every event. That makes it easy. Because all I need to do is pray and ask for my eyes to be opened to see the solution which God has already provided. That's why when, if you study all the Christians who have succeeded they succeed at an accelerated pace because they simply start seeing what God has already done. When you understand what Jesus has done, who he is and what he has done, you'll just move forward at an accelerated pace. It's not your effort which is producing it or working it out. It's stepping into what he has already provided. 
the way you connect to the father is by what? Believing in Jesus. So once you believe in Jesus Christ and what he has done, you are, the Bible says you are saved. In the, which translation is this one? It's, it's the Tyndale Bible, yeah. Which says, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you are made safe. Because Jesus comes to live in you, right? And God the Father is in Jesus. Jesus, when you believe in Jesus, Jesus comes to live in you and God the Father is in Jesus. So, if I believe that, then I know that God loves me. I know that God likes me. And I know that God likes me so much, he has chosen to give me a permanent seat in the heavens with him. That's my reality. I choose to believe that. Forget the circumstances. Forget what I'm seeing with my eyes. I choose to walk by faith. And faith is believing in Jesus. I choose to walk by believing what Jesus said. That's permanent. That won't change. Any events, any headline that's happening down here does not change what's happening in the heavens. So by believing in Jesus, I am made safe because of my position in the heavens. If I could have Ephesians chapter 1 verse 20 to 22 on the screen. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 20. I'll just read that one. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 20. So it's talking about when God worked in Christ. When he raised him from the dead and seated him right at his right hand in the heavenly places. So when Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, he was raised up. Then he sat at the right hand in the heavens far above all principalities, all power, all might, all dominion and every name that is named. Not only in this age, but in that which is to come. Do you see where you're seated now? Those principalities, powers, and mights are not above you. They've been placed under you. Once you see yourself above that, it changes your perception. Even if people come and talk about demonic activity happening in your suburb, it doesn't move you. Even if witchcraft is happening at work, so what? Who's higher? It removes all the fear. Even if there's a witch living in my suburb, who cares? <laughs> who's higher? Who's seated with God? And who's seated with the devil? It's a choice to believe. What do you want to believe? What the devil is portraying, the fear he's portraying, or to believe what God has spoken. That will set you free from so many fears. That will set you free from amazing, so many things in your life. I remember when I was young, we used to be, you know, tormented by people saying, don't wear t-shirts with a star because a star depicts this. Don't have this and that. All those unnecessary fears which don't make any sense. So we were limited in what we could wear. We were limited in what we could do. We couldn't even live in certain places. <laughs> it puts you in bondage and fear simply because you don't know who you are. But if you know who is superior, then it's the other way around. These witches should be leaving your neighborhood. Because there's a son of God in the area. And once he discovers who he is, you're in trouble. <laughs> so Ephesians, uh, no, let's go to the next verse before we, the verse after that. And he put all things under Jesus' feet and he gave him to be the head over all things to the church. No, let's go back. Just go back, yeah. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. That word church is the word ecclesia, which means the gathering of the saints or the called out ones. So basically he put everything under the feet of Jesus and gave Jesus to be the head over all things to the saints, which is you. The reason Christ is above everything and has authority over everything is for you. If you see everything from that perspective, then you'll be able to walk in the authority, which we're talking about during the prayer meeting. So could you just put Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8? Chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of yourself, but it is the gift of God. 
for by grace. It starts by grace. That is the reason why we have to study grace. If you fully understand grace, then you'll be able to experience your salvation. By not fully understanding grace, then whenever you learn about what God has provided, you'll try and work for it. You'll try and find formulas to get it. You'll try and find a method to be worthy to get it or to deserve it. But if you understand grace, then you understand that God saw in advance what you needed and he provided it before you're even born. Like I said, the Tyndale Bible says, for by grace you have been made safe through faith. Being made safe is because I'm seated in Christ. That's the safest place to be. For by grace I have been made safe through faith. And faith is talking about you believing in Jesus. So it is by grace that I've been made safe through believing in Jesus. And it was not of anything that I did. It was just a free gift from God. And the next verse explains, not of works, lest anyone should boast. None of a human activity can do what Jesus Christ did. Even if you went to a cross and died, your blood wouldn't do anything for anybody, including yourself. So it is all by grace. Don't wait until the day you deserve God's blessings. That day will never come. Your flesh will never deserve God's blessings. So that's why you take the blessings now. Don't postpone it. The thing with grace is that you can never be too good in what you have done such that you deserve God's grace. And yet at the same time you can never be too bad in what you have done such that you do not qualify for God's grace. That's why it's a free gift. It is not dependent on what you have done. It is just by you believing. And as you believe in Jesus, you are made one with him. So now let's go back to talking about our position which Jesus Christ gave us because of what he did in the heavens. Oh, of course, what he did at the cross. Um, I'll need to put this here. No, I'll put that one there, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. And I'll put this one here. Right. So, here in the heavens, this is where we reside. We're citizens of the kingdom of God. And as a citizen of the kingdom of God, you can hear God's voice. And we live by what God speaks. Men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's the defining thing when you are in the kingdom. And God's voice is the stronghold of your faith. Keep hearing what God is saying and then keep saying what he says. The easiest way to hear God's the easiest way to hear God is actually reading his word. That's the easiest starting point. Read his word and then believe his word. Believe what you read as well. Don't just read. Believe what you read. Read God's word expecting to hear God speak to you. As you read and as you study about what Jesus Christ did for you, expect to hear God speak to you. Because the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing what Jesus Christ, who Jesus Christ is and what he did for us. Faith comes by hearing the message of Christ. So, I'll read Romans chapter 5, verse 17. If you can put it on the screen. This one is another important one. Right. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. One man's offense, death reigned or death ruled through the one. If by one man's offense, which individual caused that? The Bible talks about one man causing death to reign over everyone. That individual is Adam. He was the first Adam. He was the first man on earth and he was the God of this earth. And just by one event, he caused death to reign over all of us. But the Bible says, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness 
will reign in this life through the one Jesus Christ. So how did death and how did sin and death come to every person? Simply because of what Adam did when he was in the garden. I'll read it in Genesis chapter 3. Let me read the passage to make sure. I'll go verse by verse. So, um, this, and, the, okay, let me read it. and the serpent was more cunning. If you can put Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you even touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows in that day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and knowing evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave it to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden, in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And God said, Who told you that you were naked? The first question God asks is, Who told you that you were naked? So the whole issue wasn't about that fruit on the tree. It was about the fact that who told you that you were naked? Adam, you should have been wise enough to be able to differentiate between voices. Verse 17, same chapter. Then to Adam, God said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife. Learn to differentiate voices. That will set you free in life. Because you have heeded the voice of your wife. The problem is this Adam disconnected himself from the voice of God and connected himself to the voice of the devil. The, the words were in the snake, they were transme- transmitted to Eve and then Eve brought them to Adam. And now you've got a new ruler over the world. Satan takes over. So everyone is now born as a child of the devil. So they can't live in the garden anymore. God doesn't want them to eat of the fruit which makes them live forever. So they have to move out of the garden because they are now children of the devil. They are now connected to the voice of the devil. If you learn to differentiate voices, you will solve all. A lot of problems will just evaporate instantly. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Most of your problems are simply because the counsel of the ungodly infiltrated into your life. Because I remember asking God one time about my finances. Why weren't they working? Then God showed me that whose advice have you been following for your finances? Line up all the people whom you followed advice from. How many of them are out of debt? And the answer was none. <laughs> So you ask why you are in debt. (laughs) Learn to differentiate voices. If Adam knew that the moment Eve came with these demonic words, he would have been able to recognize them. And he would have responded differently. So by disconnecting himself from the voice of God, connecting himself to the voice of of the devil, he translates himself from the kingdom of God to the kingdom of darkness. Disconnects from the words of life and is now hearing words of death. He translates from being a child of God to being a child of the devil. 
But the good news is when you got born again, you became a child of God when you believed in Jesus Christ. So you are restored back to the original plan. And this time is Jesus who is the second Adam. So if you can put Romans 5.17 again. Romans 5.17. So when you believed in Jesus, you are restored back to the original plan. Because it says, much more those who receive abundance of grace. You don't deserve it. It's an abundance of grace for you to be taken from the kingdom of darkness, to be translated into the kingdom of God, and to be one with Jesus Christ, and to be seated in the heavens. And you are given the gift of righteousness, which means you have full access to God's presence at all times. And you will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. The fact that it's much more means that this kingdom is stronger than that one. Because when you were in this kingdom, no matter how many good deeds you did, you could never get out of it. Even if you're the best person on earth, those good deeds would never translate you across. You took the blood of Jesus to take you out of here and put you in this kingdom. And this kingdom is stronger than that one. So don't be afraid. That one tiny little mistake will throw you back into that one. No, this one is stronger and is more secure. And this one is in a different realm. That's why Jesus first took care of all sin to make sure that your position in here is secure. And here you can now hear God's voice. That's why my life is exciting. Because I expect to hear God's voice every day. When I pray, I expect to hear God's voice. When I read his word, I expect to hear God's voice. When I come to church, I expect to hear from God. That's supposed to be our life, hearing from God. And when you hear from God, those words are the words that you speak. When you hear from God, write it down and speak it. That should be your vocabulary. There are certain words which we don't speak when we are in this place. In this realm, we don't speak about frustrations. <laughs> in the heavens, you don't hear the angels talking about where they are frustrated. Man, you don't you never hear that vocabulary. There are certain words the angels never speak. There was a time when an angel came to Zachariah, you see, and he gave him a message, and Zachariah started arguing with him. And this angel could not speak the same language he spoke. So he said, you'll be silenced until my word comes to pass. Because in the heavens, we speak a different language. So what God speaks to you, that's what you speak. That's what releases God's power in your life. You shall live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's our language in this realm. There's one time when Jesus had cast out a demon from a certain individual. And then he starts telling these disciples an amazing statement. He says, when a spirit is cast out, when a demon spirit is cast out, it goes around looking for somewhere where it can find rest. And it fails to find rest as it goes around the dry places. Then it decides, I will go back to the what? The house which I was in. Then it tries to come back to the house which, is, which it was in, and it even gets help from other demons to try and do that. The question is, why didn't this demon easily find a place to rest when it was going around these places? What causes those other places to be uninhabitable for a demon such that it comes back to the same person? The situation I want continually, such that even if a demon just passes by near my home or my family, by mistake, it realizes, ah, wrong address, not here. <laughs> the language that's spoken here is different. The attitude, the faith that's here, the expectation, what I hear here, I cannot stay. Even if there's a demon hiding in my house today, because of what we speak, it cannot stay. I want that environment whereby even if somebody brings it in who's visiting, it cannot stay. It just has to go. I will speak what God says. I continually expect to hear God every day and I will speak what he says. And just before I put my last scripture, if you could put Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 on the screen. So all that Adam needed to do was to differentiate voices. 
he would have never given away the entire kingdom to the devil. Just that. If he knew how to differentiate voices, even if it was coming through his wife, if he just knew how to differentiate voices, he could have been able to save the whole situation. So no matter where the, no matter who's speaking, learn to differentiate voices. Is it God speaking? Or is the other kingdom? Because there are only two kingdoms. There's nothing in between. All your thoughts that you have, either they're from the kingdom of God or from this other kingdom. There's no in between where you say, these are my thoughts. <laughs> that doesn't exist. It's either it's this one speaking or is God himself speaking to you. Learn to differentiate voices. So as I was praying, I felt I had a word for somebody. And it's simply that the reason for your pain and your destruction and your poverty continuing in your life is your loyalty to destructive systems. Just that, once you identify that destructive system, you're free. Jesus says, come unto me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you study that scripture, it actually says, take my yoke upon you, for my yoke is comfortable. That's the kingdom of God. My yoke is comfortable and my lordship is gentle. The lordship of Jesus Christ is gentle. There is no forcing. That's the language we have in these heavens. Wherever there's forcing and whatnot, that's the other kingdom. There's no gentleness in this kingdom. Things are done by force. So Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the next one. The earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters right let me see from here okay so the earth was without form and was void and darkness was on the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters so the answer to what I said before, that the reason for your pain and for your poverty and your destruction continuing in your life is your loyalty to destructive systems is found in that verse. The earth was not form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Stop focusing on the fact that there's no form, on the darkness, on the fact that it's void. And even if it's deep darkness, that's not the most important thing. The fact that God is now in your life, everything is going to change. Because the next verse, then God said, let there be light. And there was light. So the answer to your situation is just let God speak. Allow God to speak. God has come into your life. Give him the space and the opportunity to speak and there will be light and the darkness will be dispelled. As a child of God, you can hear God's voice and that is what differentiates you from everybody else. So if we can stand, I would just like us to pray. Thank you for tuning in to the Caris Church Channel with Pastor Stanley speaking. Sit down, relax, and be empowered. Thank God that you've been chosen by Him and placed in the heavens. And you are seated.